let's delve into the storied past of indigo, shedding light on how knowledge of this dye evolved and spread across cultures. Before the advent of synthetic indigo in the late 19th century, the natural form of this dye was the sole source of blue for textiles and leather, commanding a vast global demand. The beginnings of indigo are veiled in antiquity, with evidence suggesting that the domestication of indigo-producing plants likely happened independently in multiple locations around the globe. A significant archaeological find at Huaca Prieta in Peru revealed fragments of cotton dyed with indigo dating back to around 4000 BC, marking the earliest known use of this dye. However, ancient India is renowned as a pivotal region for cultivating and processing indigo, becoming a central hub for its production. Ancient China, too, developed a sophisticated indigo culture, though it remained largely secluded from the international scene. From India, the knowledge and use of indigo as a dye made its way to the Greeks and Romans, highlighting the global journey of indigo from its origins. The term indigo itself reflects this journey, originating from the Greek word indikon, meaning from India, and later Latinized by the Romans to indicum, evolving into the word indigo in various languages. This chapter aims to trace the global migration of indigo not just as a commodity, but as a body of knowledge. We honor the legacy of scientists, naturalists, and countless practitioners who dedicated their lives to understanding and mastering the art of dying with this exquisite blue pigment. During the Renaissance, we have some earliest texts mentioning indigo, even in Middle Age, under the name of indigo from Baghdad. The first road for indigo, to trade indigo, the first was from Baghdad, in Iraq. One thousand and one night tale you know Sinbad the sailor is quitting Baghdad and goes to Basra and in Basra he takes his boat, probably a very small boat and if you see the map from Basra it is easy to follow the coast and you go to India. So he takes the indigo there, come back to Basra and back to Baghdad again, and then from Baghdad it goes to different countries, including Europe. So the first road for indigo was from Baghdad, so the Western people knew the indigo, even the Roman people. So it is an old story, not only the Arabic were trading, but also the Egyptian people. Not so many uh, uses of indigo were known, so it's mentioned for leather, at the time, it's mentioned a little bit for silk. Western people also use this indigo for painting, so painters know it. But it's, I would say it's a kind of confidential thing, but it is well known. So at some period, the second road for importing the indigo was a very long road by the sea, going all along, the boats could go all along Africa, to the Cape of Good Hope and then in the Indian Ocean. They say that the first coming back from India to Indigo, it was around 1515. This is very renowned, so the, the 1000 night tales, it is around the 8th century. In Europe, it is the period of Charlemagne, Carolus Magnus, the, the emperor of Europe before Europe was created, but kind of similar. So that's an old road, road, and we have some documents that show that it was also from the antiquity, uh, Egyptian antiquity, going to Roma. Pliny the Elder say, well, we call it Indicum because it comes from India, and that was for painters. And the second road 
It's Eduardo Barboa, which is Portuguese. Came back with a big boat full of indigo in that period. So that was the beginning of 16th century. Then the Portuguese started to trade the, the indigo. That's the historical date that is mentioned in many, many books. But then from that period, many uh, different countries, European countries, they started with long sailing, crossing the Good Hope Cape to go to India. So of course the Spanish, Sp Spanish went to this trade and then the, the um, Dutch, uh, also the English. And the very late to start with this business where the French from that period came one type of indigo that I would call Indian indigo. And we have some descriptions of that. I do not have time enough to, to enter in all details. I would like to write that as a kind of booklet that could complement this tutorial. But actually, I'll just give a few lines. The Indian indigo is described clearly with a special process. First people, they, uh, they harvest the indigo fir bush and then they dry the leaves and when it is dry they process them by soaking and beating quite similar than what we did and then this indigo is called indigo in um, like a chestnut shape so they, they call it chestnut indigo which is the shape of kind of chestnut people were doing the mud as you have seen as we did and putting some oil on their hands they were taking a bit of mud making a, a ball putting that to dry uh, on the sand and then uh, they were uh, sold like it is but later the the, the spanish people uh, so that was the uh, a second, I would call it Chinese. The Spanish people came to S Indonesian islands, which is Amboine. Indonesia. And this was a territory occupied by Chinese. And in Indonesia, in Amboine, uh, during the 16th century, Chinese were processing indigo differently. They were using fresh leaves, so the Spanish people. So these are Portuguese and the, the Spanish people went to Indonesia and they have seen the fresh leaves and then they, that's interesting process because from the fresh leaves they do the mud, as you know. So they, they have the kind of macerate from the leaves, then they aerate and they do the mud. I would say the mud in the Chinese people were not drying the indigo. They were using it as a mud. As, so the Spaniards uh, understood that it was difficult to trade the mud because, you know, you have to put that in jars, which at the time they are made of earth. And on the boats, after one year of travel, the jars might choke them each other and it could da damage make us travel damage all the mud uh, being being fluted so um, they got the idea of, of having kind of hybrid because in india they have seen that to process them uh, uh, they, they process the, the indigo plant to make dry powder or the dry cakes so they took the mud and they did dry it so the Spanish business was based on dry indigo from this process. But very soon they discovered there were new territories in America. So in uh, Caribbean islands, the Spanish, of course, it's well known that Christophe Colomb first arrived in Cuba, Hispaniola. Uh, they, they took this island of Santo Domingo and they started with uh, indigo making which is the description of that. So they were inspired by the Chinese style to make a kind of Western style. 
But that's interesting to know that the French people took Santo Domingo by war and they discovered all the system so the pools to make quantities of indigo and the slaves giving the hand uh, to make the business the, to make the job and everything so it came from the Spanish to to French islands so that's very interesting that they they were trans the, the Spanish did transfer this technology to Saint Domingue and the French adopted in Guadeloupe the English people did colonize India and they were absolutely fascinated by one of the French books explaining how to process the indigo. This French book was written by Tavernier. So the book of Tavernier was so impressive of simplicity, efficiency, that the English did translate it in, in English. And then they did follow this style to make indigo in India. So that, that's very interesting because the first indigo came from India, from dried leaves of indigo fir. But then it came back, a new process came and uh, I would say it is called, even today by uh, Indian people, it is called the English process, which requires fresh leaves and big pools. That's interesting because this Indian indigo from dried leaves was made in jars. Uh, dried, le dried leaves process them in jars. We have plenty of texts and explanations about that. So it came back to India, but initially it was that Chinese indigo that they discovered, uh, Spanish discovered in India that were transferred to islands of America, then catch by French, who did improve it and published lots of books to um, improve the quality. And then it was catch by English to come back to India and develop that style in, in Bengal. So that's a very crazy story. But from that, you can see that the dried leaves process is probably one of the most ancient because whenever you have a very small garden, you can ha have several cuts of indigo and dry the, dry the leaves and then put uh, store them until the moment you have enough for the indigo production. So that's interesting. But by developing the fresh leaves, as Chinese did, it did open to the future because afterwards people did develop uh, indigo from fresh leaves of wood and then from fresh leaves of persicaya because those other indigo plants could not be processed by drying the leaves. So that's, that's very interesting. When, the disco when French people discovered the Chinese culture, they were extremely impressed and they, tr they started uh, during the 18th century. They, they started to write real encyclopedia of Chinese culture. So the priests, they were Catholic priests, and then mentioning everything they discover in China, and some of them, Father Sibo, who is working in Beijing at the time, uh, is mentioning five to six different indigo plants. So the time we could consider that China was the country with the most extended culture of indigo because they were using Isotis indigotica, they were using Persicaria tinctoria, they were using Strobilantes cusia, and also in the south Indigofera tinctoria. So the four main cultivated indigo plants at big scale, I mean, were already developed in China. What's the common process for all these? The common process is the fresh, fresh leaves process because only one can be processed with dried leaves, the Indian one, the, the only one that Indian developed 
endlessly. So the Chinese had a range of, a range of different plants with only one mother process, one main process, that of fresh leaves. So if you process the fresh leaves by soaking, so it, it takes more volume because of course the dried leaves is also one method for concentrating and using less water if you dried leaves. But you cannot dry any kind of leaf to make the indigo. So the Chinese were using their four main plants by this process. And this process became the historical process. So at the end I would say that the Spanish uh, did not adopt the Indian process. The French did not adopt the Indian process nor the other European, uh, Dutch and, and others. So that's the Chinese process, which became the future of industrial development.